let's do the applaud one more time, but do it for the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, let's appreciate him. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. We praise you. We honor you. We're so grateful for your love, your patience, your kindness towards us. Thank you for this house. Thank you for the leadership of this house. Thank you that you've taken this incredibly large body of Christ and localized it in communities around the world. Thank you for this local expression of your love, your life, and your light. Thank you for this day that we celebrate the resurrection and the newness of life every time we meet on Sunday. Thank you for this new beginning that you gave to humanity. So our hearts and minds are open to your Holy Spirit. Give us your wisdom, your insight. Teach us how to live out our faith, to live the Christian difference in a world that's so contrary. Bless us this morning, we ask. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It is good to be with you. Can I sit and talk? It's funny. Some people call it a sermon. Some call it a talk. Some call it a lecture. Uh, Whatever you call it, learn from it and, and take notes. I bring you greetings from my wife. We celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary in October 1st of this year. Uh, thanks. Uh, one person understood what that meant. You got to understand what that means, okay? To be together for 50 years. Okay, that's a major, major accomplishment in a time when unfortunately people get married and try it out. And they try it out several times. Uh, but that's the way of the world. For us, it's a sacrament. For us, it's, it's a commitment. So, of course, we started dating when we were five, got married when we were eight years old, (laughs) just to give the age context of it. My seven sons, I bring you greetings from them, and uh, we're about to experience our 26th grandchild is on the way, I found out (laughs) two weeks ago. So, figured, no matter if my whole church gets mad at me and leaves, I'll still have a congregation, because... (laughs) I'll make my family come to church, right? Praise the Lord. This is an interesting time. It's always an interesting time when it comes to living the Christian difference, living out our faith in a world that's contrary. Jesus said, in the world, we'll have tribulation. He said, we are not of this world. We're in it, but we're not of it. We're not a product of its way of thinking and doing and what it forms it, its counterfeit loves, its its counterfeit values. We get our way of thinking and living from the kingdom of God, which is expressed and revealed so beautifully in Scripture. And one of the things that the Scripture reveals is that God has given us stewardship responsibility, four stewardship responsibilities. Number one, stewardship over our time. Number two, stewardship over our talent, because all of us have an ability, a gift that God's given us. Stewardship over our treasury, the money that will come. And God doesn't give you wealth. He gives you power to get wealth. He gives you opportunities and open doors so that you can experience wealth, which is necessary within this world in which we live. Fourth, he gives us stewardship responsibility over our relationships. Relationships is the network for life and can be the most challenging stewardship responsibility. It's amazing how you can manage your money and struggle with your relationships. But of course, I'm not talking to anybody here because you are just so good at managing relationships. You're fine. Amen? No, the reality is that we all struggle, whether it's family or friends, whether it's a spouse, you know, business, whatever it may be. But relationships are key. Relationships take us into new seasons. Relationships take us to new levels of life and stages of life. Some relationships are for a reason that God brings that person. Some relationships are for a season because of the specific season that we may may be in. 
And some relationships are for a lifetime. People that God brings to walk with us this journey of life and help us make sense of it and understand it. I will tell you that as you move, because we live life on levels, we arrive in stages, as you move from one level of life to another, you will find that there's always a key relationship that help you to get to that next level or open that door for you. I say that because we don't value relationships the way we should. And in this disposable microwave world in which we live, we want everything instant and everything is disposable. So if it doesn't work, we throw it away. But that's not how God designed it. And relationships are key. I say that because I cherish the relationship I have with your pastor and his lovely wife, Deanna. Um, and I, I'm very careful in how I manage the, spa- the relational spaces of my life. Because everyone in your life occupies a certain space. If you could picture a bullseye with the dot in the middle, and then you have the circles. How many have ever seen? Uh, you've seen a bullseye, right? Okay, I want to make sure I'm on the planet Earth here. All right. So you notice the circles, right? And the spaces between the circles. So if you picture relationships as you in the middle, and then there are people who occupy these different spaces in proximity to you. Some people are close. Some people are a little bit of a distance away. And some people are at an extended distance. And some people are not even on the bullseye. That's reality. And throughout our lives, we're managing those spaces because the closer people are to you, the more mature they need to be because if they're not mature, then when they discover things about you, because the closer you get, right, the more you see, they can't handle those things. So proximity in terms of people in relationship with you has to be managed carefully And people closest to you have to be there for a purpose and because they're mature enough to handle that space. Often in life, we have to rethink and reevaluate the spaces in which people exist. How many of you ever had to reevaluate the space that someone occupied? Maybe they were close, and all of a sudden you realize that they were not mature enough to handle that space. This is especially true as we move from one level of life to another. Remember, we live life on levels and we arrive in stages. Come on, say that with me. We live life on levels and we arrive in stages. So you're not here to hear a sermon. You're here to learn truth because Jesus says truth will set you free. Sermons can inspire you. It's a wonderful thing. But you come to learn truth. The power of truth is what liberates you. So people occupy spaces, and sometimes when we move from one level of life to another, the intimacy of our relationships must change because that person is not moving to the next level with you. And when you have a situation like that, that person may not understand it because they're not maturing, they're not growing with you, and they may be upset with you because the relationship is changing between you and them. And it's not that you don't love them anymore, it's that you're moving to another level of life and they're choosing to stay down here. That makes sense? Am I preaching to anyone on... All right? Yeah, because the gospel is where we live. It's where we live, right? So managing relationships is important and having the right relationships in our lives. I'm going to have you do this because this is what I do. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor. If you're the smartest one in your group, you need a new group. Yeah? Because if you don't have people in your circle of relationships that can challenge you, hold you accountable, stretch you, increase your capacity, add to you, cause you stress towards better changes in your life, then you need to get some new relationships. Amen? Because the only way you're going to grow 
is by having the right people in the spaces in your life. The scripture says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and gained favor with God and man. So it's not just your relationship with God, right? Because then you'd be on a mountain by yourself. But it's also your relationship with people. So relationships are vertical, and there's only one vertical relationship, and that's your relationship with God, right? All other relationships occupy a horizontal plane. And the better we are at managing our relationships and our relational spaces, the better we will be in life. So what happens, Dr. Bernard, if you have someone occupying a space that they're no longer mature enough for or no longer serving a purpose? What do you do? I'm glad you asked. Let me give you the three R's. You retrain them. Because maybe you can help them up. Maybe you can help change the way they think and qualify them for that space once again. You don't give up on people right away. but Maybe you can teach them, train them, help them up if they choose to be helped. Amen? Everybody doesn't choose to be helped. Amen? So, if you can help them up. So, you, you, you retrain them. And there are some people who just don't want to be taught. They don't want to learn. They don't want to grow. And they're, they're in that realm of emotion where you're leaving them, so they're mad at you because you think you're all that now just because you're moving to another level of life. And it's not that. Let's all move together. Let's all grow together. But everybody doesn't want to grow at the same time. Some people want to stay stuck in certain places. And if you're smart, you won't let them hold you there. Because now you're sacrificing your future for someone else's lack of maturity and lack of passion for growth. Thank you for the amens. So you try to retrain them. It's true if you run a business and you have employees, and employees can handle, let's say one employee can handle 10 things, and the moment you give them, and they do the 10 things very well, and the moment you give them that 11th thing, all of a sudden they fall apart, their productivity goes down, everything starts changing. Well, in business language, they have Peter principle. That simply means they reach their maximum level of productivity, and to go beyond that, they become unproductive. What do you do in a situation like that? You 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 retrain them, right? But if you can't retrain them, the next thing is you have to reposition them. Put them in a place where they can flourish. Same thing is true in your personal relationships. When you can't retrain someone, get someone to, to understand where you are in life now and what your life is about as you're moving and growing in life then you have to move them from that space that was close to the bullseye and kind of move them a little bit further out. They may not like that. They may not understand that. But if they value the relationship, they'll make the adjustments. So the first thing is to retrain. Next thing is to reposition. Right? How many of you ever had to do that? You've had relationships that... You're growing, and they're not growing with you, and, and you've, you know, you've had to kind of move them away. And, and, and how do you do that? Well, in human relationships, distance is never measured in miles. It's measured in affection. So it's by way of affection that you control the distance between you and another person. That's why two people can be on the opposite sides of the planet, and yet because there's so much affection between them, there's no distance. And two people can be in the same bed and yet miles apart because there's no affection. Amen? Yeah, that's real. So we control spaces and distance by the degree of affection that we extend. And why that's important is because to be affectionate means to be vulnerable. It means to be transparent. So you have to be careful how you extend that out. So, Dr. Bernard, there's one R left. Yes, you keep asking the right questions. <laughs> so, the first one is what? 
That wasn't a good answer. I'm going to leave. That was a threat. Okay, so the first one is what? Retrain. Retrain, right? Invest in that person. Maybe you can help them come around and get it. And some people, for whatever reason, they may not get it at that particular time. Jesus said in one occasion to his disciples, he says, I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. You can't handle it. The reason why my, one of the reasons why my wife and I are, are married for 50 years, together for 50 years, is because we understood that there were times when we were not ready to have a necessary conversation. So we'll wait for the right timing. But we make sure we don't forget about it altogether because, remember, it's a necessary conversation. So you have to wait and, you know, approach is always determined by the level of maturity of the person you're approaching. I'm going to say that one more time. Approach is always determined by the level of maturity of the person you're approaching. That makes sense? So what's the first R? Retrain. Retrain. And whether you're in this room or across the street watching or across the country or around the world, retrain. What's the second R? Reposition. What's that? Reposition. Reposition. Yeah, reposition. The third Well, you're into it. <laughs> Retire. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are times when it gets to the place where there can't be that kind of relationship with that person because there's an unwillingness to change. And change is the only constant in life. Now, if you're married and you're listening to this message, don't go home and say, Dr. Bernard said I have to retire you. <laughs> don't go home to your spouse and tell him I said that. See, marriage is a special relationship because it puts you in a pressure cooker where you have to work through your differences of opinions, ideas, etc. And that's why premarital counseling is so important because we have a seven-week training program for people who want to get married. We spend seven weeks trying to convince them not to get married. We talk about money, relationships, sex. I mean, everything we could talk about to get their idea on it. And we put them through the, the, the pressure cooker, really. We do. I'm serious. We, we set it up to try to... Because we want them to be sure about the decision. Marriage is not something you try out. It's a commitment that you honor God and take on a responsibility in a space that you will occupy and share intimately with another person. Again, relationships, the power of relationships. Change is the only constant in life. I'll try that again. Change is the only constant constant in life. We are constantly going through changes, making changes, changing clothes, changing jobs, changing atmospheres, relationships, you name it. Change is the only constant in life. Change is the essence of maturation. Change is the essence of maturation. You will not mature unless you're willing to change. You will not mature unless you're willing to change. It's true for an individual. It's true for a marriage. It's true for a friendship. It's true for business. It's true for ministry. Change is the only constant in life. In fact, the secret to longevity is managing continuity and change. And the key to managing continuity and change is knowing what to change and what not to change. Because change doesn't mean everything. Because there's certain elements that should cons consistently continue. But there's certain things that need to change. 
change is the essence of maturation. You'll never mature unless you're willing to change. And there are people who resist change. They don't want to change. And that's why they don't grow. That's why they don't grow. I'm sometimes a teacher, but always a student. A fool thinks he knows enough. A fool thinks he knows enough. A fool thinks he knows enough. But a wise man is always learning, always a student, always inquiring, always open to hear, to understand, to seek, to knock, to ask, right? Very important. So change is the only constant in life. Change is the essence of maturation. When change is necessary, not to change, but truth brings the conviction necessary to change. Because truth challenges our words, thoughts, motives, actions, attitudes, and our choices. And if you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not just to make you jump and shout and say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. No, he's called the spirit of truth. Which means that another thing that he does in your life as he conforms you to the image of Jesus is confront you with truth about yourself, about those that you allow into the spaces of your life, about what you're thinking, the direction you're going in. All of those things come into play. Here's another reality of change. It's called entering and leaving. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Today. Turn to your neighbor and say, he just finished the introduction. <laughs> and I always run out of time. I haven't finished a sermon in 40 years. <laughs> Keep them wanting more. Leave them hanging. Give them just enough to want to come back. And that's the way it should be. We spend our whole lives entering and leaving, Right? So when Jesus said, in the world you'll have tribulation, and throughout the scripture, how about this one, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, when I would do good, evil is present. He called it a law. He said, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present. How many of you found that law? How many discovered that one? Everybody in here, your hand should be up because if ever you try to do good, there's always something coming to undermine that good. I don't care what you, and you have to be, you have to get better at identifying when it shows up, because sometimes evil shows up as good. Paul said that's a law, that's a principle, that when I would do good, evil is present. And evil is present to undermine the good that you would do. So essentially, the Bible teaches that life is both threat and promise. Threat and promise promise. Life is both threat. Life can be very threatening, right? But it's also full of promise. In fact, the Bible has 8,810 promises from God about your life. So life is both what? I can't hear you. Life is both what? Which means that in spite of the threats, what should you be looking for? Have you ever used the term, you know what? This is promising. What are you saying? There's potential there. There's capacity there. There's goodness there. It's going to take work. Going to have to tap into it. But it's there. Right? Life is both what? I don't care what, you know, listen, listen, you're going to get a lot of this. There'll be bold print that the Holy Spirit brings out to you. You're going to leave here and remember some of the things that I said to you. But these little nuggets that I'm giving you right here, right now, make sure you get that into your notes. Life is both what? Threat and promise. So what have you got to look for? What do you have to be aware of? Otherwise, you're naive. And you can't be naive when it comes to living life. Life is both what? 
and promise. Let me add to your repertoire. I'm equipping you to win against the devil. You ever heard of that guy? Some people don't believe he exists while he continues to do havoc, wreak havoc. So life is both threat and promise. Life is also adversity with opportunity. Life is also adversity with opportunity. So whenever adversity comes, what should you be looking for? See, the Bible in, in, in Romans chapter 12 said, you'll be transformed by the renewing of your car. <laughs> your house, your clothes, your shoes, your hair. No, the renewing of your... Because the quality of your thinking determines the quality of your life. People who have a poor life suffer from poor thinking. Say it with me. The quality of my thinking determines the quality of my life. So if I want my life to change, I got to change the way I think. Amen. I don't know if you recognize it yet because of my style, which is conversational, but this is good preaching right here. Can I get an amen from somebody? I've been around the world over the last 40 years in different cultures, different contexts, and I've experienced all styles of worship and services and ministry and everything, and I enjoy them all. Most important, I want to leave with something that changes the way I think about life, the way I do life. Amen? Amen. So with adversity, there is also what? Let me bring it down on the ground. Can I do that? Share a little bit from my personal life. I don't do this that often, but we live in a world where everybody wants to know what you had for breakfast. I don't get it. On social media, I'm having a bagel. <gasps> 10,000 followers. I don't get it. I don't get it. Help me. I, I, maybe I'm old-fashioned. I don't know. You know, and I'm careful with those followers things because I know some people who have over 200,000 followers and no friends. You want me to repeat that one, right? That was good. One. Yeah. Over 200,000 followers and no friends. And I will tell you, friends are more important than followers. See, you made me lose my thought, my train of thought. Where was I? Let's see if you were listening. So, I'm going to give you a practical example. So, we're, we're in the process of moving from one house to a, another. How many know that process of moving? So, you know, um, the toughest thing was moving my wife. Yeah, I'm being very careful here, right? This is being tape recorded live stream. She may be watching. I got you, babe. So, and here's why. Because her, and we all have primary motivational needs. Her motivational need, and most women share this motivational need, and that is for safety and security. Most women want to be safe and secure. Not just in their environment, but in their relationships, right? And the man that makes them feel safe and secure they find it easier to love that man, to respect and follow that man. So moving from one house to another is a disruption because it means adjusting to something new. It's changing in context. Remember, change. The only constant in life, and we're changing. And she's thinking about adjusting to this new house after she's gotten comfortable and whatnot. So we started moving boxes and furniture and stuff like that. But we knew 
that we could move a lot faster. We meaning my sons and my grandchildren who were helping out. We could move a lot faster once we got her out of the house. Because while we were packing things, she said, well, let me see that. Let me check that. She wanted to check every box, everything we were looking to take, what we wanted to throw away. And we wanted to throw away all of it. But she said, let me. And we knew as long as she kept inspecting everything, it was going to take us a few years to move. So we knew the key was, get her out of the house. So we renovated the new house, got everything set up, and everything set up, let's let's, let's move. And um, it just wasn't working because she still had to look through some stuff. So the landscapers came, and they were aerating the soil, you know, in our our front yard, and and she... um, when she was still in, in the old house. And while they were doing it, it's these, these blades, these circular blades that go down about six inches into the soil to dig up the soil and aerate it and all that. And they cut the cable that provided telephone, television, and internet. They cut it. So my wife calls me and she says, I lost the television, the phone is down, the internet is down. I said, let me check. And I realized that that's what happened. And she said, what are we going to do? I said, well, I'm going to have to call Verizon and have them come in. And, you know, they're going to have to come and dig it up, lay new cable because they can't just patch it. This is going to take a couple weeks. And she said, oh, this is awful. With... Adversity comes what? The adversity was the cut cable. No movies, no TV, no internet, no telephone. She's isolated on an island by herself. But I had the solution. Because with adversity comes what? And you can't get hung up on the adversity. You got to look for the what? So I started looking. I said, aha. I said, well, look, baby. The new house has internet, TV, (laughs) cable. All that you need is right there. Yeah, but I'm not finished packing. I said, no, 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 listen, listen. You can just pack a few things like you and I are going to go away for a few days. Come over to the new house. You can stay there while they work on fixing the cable. She said, yeah, I could do that. So we got her over there. She hasn't left since. (laughs) And we're almost finished moving. (laughs) I say, well, that was a little sneaky. No, it was creative. (laughs) It was not getting hung up on the adversity, but looking for the opportunity because life is both threat and promise adversity with adversity with come on adversity with so whenever there's an adversity there's also what and most people spend time on the adversity lamenting making themselves miserable instead of using their creativity and innovation to find the opportunity so life is both threat and promise adversity with what how about this one life is also opportunity with adversity life is also opportunity with adversity so just as with adversity opportunity comes it is also true commutative law right that when an opportunity presents itself, you know there's going to be some adversity that comes with it. There's going to be some challenges. There are going to be challenges. That's the way it is. So let me kind of bring this to a close in the time that I don't have left. (laughs) So three weeks ago, I had what I call a 
while he was yet speaking moment. You need to write that down because that's the title of my message. While he was yet speaking. I had a while he was yet speaking moment. For the past five years, I've been working with my partners on a $1.2 billion development project in Brooklyn, New York. We're developing 10 and a half acres, bringing in 2,000 units of housing at different income levels, bringing in retail, commercial, performing arts center. It is one of the major projects in the country. And we are a 50, 50% partner on this particular project. And we've been going through a process of meeting with elected officials, meeting with all of the community stakeholders, all the getting approvals, rezoning, all of the stuff. You don't want to know what goes into it for the last five years. We're actually working on it eight years, but with this particular partnership for the last five years. And three Mondays ago, it was 5 p.m., 1,700 hours, 5 p.m. And I got a call because the next day they were going to vote on our project. And after spending all that time and millions of dollars, they could turn around and say no. And there's nothing we can do except go back to the drawing board. So we're about to vote. I get a call. And from one of the principal individuals who says, you know, I think that you need to change this. And to change that meant that the project would no longer be feasible. Because when you're doing projects, there's got to be feasibility as well as affordability. Because if you, if, 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 you, if you build something that you can't afford to maintain, then it's only going to go downhill. And how many know it's easier to obtain than to maintain? Absolutely. And when it comes to housing, it's the sustainability that's critical. So we try to find a balance between feasibility and affordability. We struck that balance, and they wanted to come and disrupt that balance. So that happened when I got the call, 5 p.m. So now we had a meeting at 6 p.m. And within that hour, I got another call. Remember, adversity kept showing up. I got another call about something else. And then something happened with my 90-year-old mom where she had a focal seizure and had to be taken to the hospital. And then I got another call, and then I got another call. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm preparing for this meeting at 6 o'clock, and we've got to recrunch numbers and come back with an alternative response to what was being requested of us. And it, it just, it was, and so five minutes, no, it was, I'm sorry, 10 to 6, 5.50, I'll never forget it, 10 to 6. Everything just came down, and I felt the stress. I felt the pressure because we're dealing with a lot here. And I said, Lord, this is mentally demanding. And I wasn't complaining. I was simply expressing how I felt at that moment. Have you ever got to that point where you felt the pressure, you felt the stress, and maybe you didn't say it in those words? I try to be careful what I say to God. I said, Lord, this is mentally demanding. And it was one of those few times that God responded so quickly, it startled me. All I heard was, this is the level you're playing at. I had no response. What could I say? If this is what takes place at this level, we live life on what? Come on. Levels. We arrive in what? Stages. And if this is what happens at this level, then there's only one response. Actually, two. I could quit or step it up. And I understood clearly what God meant. I didn't have to ask him, get into a conversation, negotiate. It was clear. This is the level you're playing at. So this is what happens at this level, which means if you want to function at this level, step it up. Now, I don't know how God talks to you. He speaks to me in normal language, the way I understand it, the way I would hear it. You know, some, some saints, they hear from God. It's, you know, if thou wouldest thitherest, hitherest doest. I don't have that kind of relationship with God. He speaks to me in plain language. Okay? And I suggest you lean on that side. So, but it was that moment. 
And of course, I look to the scripture, first chapter of Job, chapter one, all right? Because if I don't give you some, and I've been giving you verses all along, but do you notice these words? A messenger came to tell Job that his flocks were stolen by an enemy and army. And then it says in Job 1.16, and while he was yet speaking, some more bad news came. That his children were gathered in a house and the fire of God came, like blaming God, right? Destroyed everything. He lost his children. He lost his wealth. He lost his herds. And then another verse says, and while he was yet speaking, some more bad news came. And I will tell you, that hour from, 6 p- from 5 p.m. to 5.50, it was one of those while he was yet speaking moments for me. That bad news was coming one after another, and I had to choose how I was going to respond to it. And I knew that I was leaving one level and entering another just by the degree of demand it was making upon me spiritually, morally, intellectually, and emotionally. And either I was going to embrace it as opportunity or lament the adversity. I'll give you the key in in Job because some people say that Job's response was he got down in sackcloth and ashes and he worshipped God. And I heard sermons preached about this. But that's not what was highlighted in the text. And let's go to our Bible finally. We've been in it. What was Job's response? And people preached, oh, Job started worshiping and praising God, saying hallelujah in spite of it. That sounds great. Good sermon. But let's look at what the text highlights. Verse 22, chapter 1, book of Job, not Job. (laughs) Reading from the English Standard Version, in all this, everything that was going down. And see, we have the advantage of knowing that Satan was behind it, right? Right? How many, how many read the book of Job? How many got that far in your Bible reading? Okay. It's right before the book of Genesis. That was a test. Look at what he said. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God. Come on. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. You see that? See, often it's not what you do in response to calamity and adversity. It's what you refuse to do that gives you the victory. He refused to submit to his flesh, to his human nature, and allow his human nature to dictate his response to the tribulation he was experiencing it. And he also refused to hold God responsible for the bad things that were happening. Because we live in a world where when bad things go wrong and if you claim faith in God, they ask you right away, where's your God? And if God is so good, why is he letting this happen to you? How many heard that kind of? Job refused to let that come into his mind. Again, it's not always what you do, but often what you refuse to do that gives you the victory. He refused to let his flesh take over, his human nature take over, his emotions take over. And he refused to blame God. So what did he do on the other side of it? What was he anchored in? I'm glad you asked. Number one, you've been asking all the right questions this morning. Thank you. Made my job easy. Number one, three things that Job was anchored in throughout this adversity. Number one, he was anchored in a right relationship with material and spiritual prosperity. 
he knew that God gives, God takes away. How many notice that you don't see a U-Haul truck following a hearse at a funeral? You can't take it with you. We come into the world with nothing. We leave the world with nothing. So our whole lives, we're simply stewards of everything and possessors of nothing. Job understood that his spiritual wealth, because God said that he was what? A righteous man. And his material wealth, he did not let it rule him and be the idol in his life. So number one, he was anchored in a right relationship because some people, if they lose material wealth, guess what? They fall apart. They give up on God, give up on church, give up on everything. That's because they had a wrong relationship with material prosperity. And some people, if, if they don't feel God or experience God now, and there's a season of drought or, or wilderness experience, they'll get mad and give up. No. They understand that even spiritual prosperity is a gift from God. Second, he was anchored in the providence of God. He believed that God is the one who was sustaining and guiding his life. He believed that. Let me tell you something. Sometimes you have to abandon yourself to providence. I don't understand all that's going on, but I'm trusting God. That even if I lose it all, that same God who gave it to me the first time can bring it back again. He was anchored in that. And thirdly, he was anchored in the character of God. He knew that no matter what his circumstances, God is just. God is just. And because God is just, he knew that he didn't do anything to warrant all of this. But he knew that God would be fair and just towards him. And sure enough, God restored, multiplied what Job had in the beginning that he lost. God multiplied it ten times over. This is how we live the Christian difference because we're being watched. And how we live it out is really the greatest witness and testimony to our faith. Not your Sunday service, not wearing the cross, not carrying a giant Bible. No, it's how you live the Christian difference. Did you get anything out of this today? This is the mega theme in scripture, the redemption of humanity and the restoration of Eden. That's what the whole Bible is about, human flourishing. God wants you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. We have an amazing God that we serve. He loves us on a deep and profound level. And it's our job to get to know him better every day, learning a little bit more. Come on, let's all stand. Now, Pastor told me I had till midnight, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you out early. How's that? There was a lot coming to you today, but there's what is called the bow print. Those things that just hit you when you heard it. Take that seriously because that's what God is trying to get to you in this moment. And that's the most important thing you need to hear and to experience. I didn't want to just hype you. I wanted to give you something that you could feed on for the rest of your life. Did you get that? Good. Let's bow our heads as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to sit at your feet and receive your word. Because you sent your word to heal us and deliver us from destruction. Thank you for the incarnation of that word, that word becoming flesh and dwelling among us and living 
in the realm in which we live, experiencing all that we experience, conquering it to show us a way and an example. Father, may the word, which is always sown in seed form, take root in the hearts and minds of your people. Let it, its roots go deep. Let the tree grow. And let them enjoy the fruit that your word brings. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Thank you.